Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, on behalf of Embassy of Pakistan, Washington, D.C., I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished panelists, as well as our attendees joining from different parts of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored with the gracious presence of Ms. Jean Gardner. She is a Professor Amarita of Earth History and Architecture at the New School, New York, along with Mr. Aftabur Rahman Rana, who is Managing Director of Pakistan Tourism Development Corporation. Mrs. Shaista Mahmood, President, International Friendship Club, Washington, D.C. Dr. Asma Ibrahim, Founder and Director of State Bank Museum, Archives and Art Gallery Department, uh, Karachi. Uh, and uh, Mr. Zain Mustafa, an architect and educationist based in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, I would request uh, Ms. Shaista Mahmood uh, for her remarks. Shaista, unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you, Malia, for uh, inviting us. And thank you so much uh, for doing this presentation for our club. Our club actually started uh, during the Eisenhower administration and are inspired by the words of the 28th president of the United States, the President Woodrow Wilson. He said, friendship is the only cement that will ever hold the world together. So on this note, I would like to uh, thank Ambassador uh, Asad for uh, arranging this uh, our virtual uh, trip to Pakistan. As I was, because I was born in Pakistan and I grew up in Lahore, a very cultural city in Pakistan. So I have a lot of fond memories of Pakistan and I'm really excited to see the presentation of Pakistan from uh, different uh, parts of Pakistan, which I have never visited, especially in the Sindh. So Ambassador, thank you so much. And we are very grateful for your time. We are very appreciative of your, all your efforts and all the panelists who are joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Shaista. Now I would request His Excellency Ambassador, Dr. Asad Majid Khan for his welcome remarks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Malia, and uh, good morning once again uh, to uh, all those joining us uh, from here in on the East Coast uh, and those uh, in Pakistan. A, a very good uh, evening uh, to and in different parts of the world. The beauty of having these virtual webinars and conversation is that you can actually cover the entire globe. So these greetings sometimes become uh, either irrelevant or redundant. So still, uh, we are delighted uh, to host this webinar. We are very grateful uh, to International uh, Friendship Club uh, and uh, to uh, its president, uh, uh, Ms. Shaisa Mahmood, uh, for collaborating with the embassy in organizing uh, this important uh, webinar on Pakistan's uh, heritage uh, and our uh, tourism uh, potential. Uh, really, I think, uh, uh, and I'm so very glad uh, to see a very distinguished panel today, uh, which would uh, cover for the audience today. And then this uh, webinar is also going to be recorded uh, and then put uh, on our website. So these important presentations would uh, uh, basically cover various dimensions of Pakistan's rich uh, cultural heritage. Uh, some say here that uh, Pakistan is a well-kept uh, secret when it comes to our economic uh, and, and tourism potential. So we are going to discover that secret today, hopefully through uh, the important presentations uh, that we are going to see. Because over the past, I would say, particularly four or five years, uh, starting uh, uh, with uh, 2018, uh, a number of uh, credible well-recognized uh, international tourism societies have started to see uh, uh, the jewel that Pakistan is uh, for those interested in various kinds of tourism. So uh, the British Backpackers Society back in 2018 uh, recognized Pakistan as a top tourist destination. Subsequently, uh, Forbes and Condé Nast also in 19, 2019 and 20 respectively also recognize Pakistan uh, as uh, a very important uh, tourist destination. Now, unfortunately, uh, because of COVID, 
those opportunities, uh, even uh, for those who were ready and willing uh, to take that plunge, uh, could not be made available because of the travel restrictions imposed uh, in the context of COVID. So uh, we actually thought that perhaps, you know, this is time uh, for us to basically bring Pakistan uh, to the comfort of your living room. Uh, particularly for those who are still making up their mind, because I know people are actually uh, almost sick and tired of uh, sitting back and not being able to travel. And they are looking at possibilities and destinations that they would like to explore uh, once uh, normal traveling uh, is restored. So uh, through this uh, effort, uh, we are trying uh, to bring Pakistan and uh, what we have on offer uh, to the comfort of your uh, living room. What I think perhaps you can still not see uh, through these presentations is actually uh, the, the warmth and hospitality of our people. And that is something that you can only experience uh, once you get to go to Pakistan. So mm -hmm. this is really a very humble effort uh, to basically, because I think that is our biggest asset, the warmth and hospitality. And ask anyone and everyone who has been to Pakistan uh, uh, they would uh, confirm to you how well received they were. So I thank all the panelists for uh, uh, making themselves available and for working very hard on their, uh, I would say, quite extensive presentations, uh, which I look forward to uh, seeing, enjoying and learning from. So thank you very much. Thank you, um, Ambassador Asad Majid Khan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, I will invite our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Aftabur Rahman Rana, who is Managing Director of Pakistan Tourism Development Corporation. And he's also President of Sustainable Tourism Foundation Pakistan and a member of National Tourism Coordination Board. Uh, Mr. Rana has also recently worked with UNESCO to engage lo local community of Ritas Fort in heritage conservation. He has trained local community tour guides and also local women in producing heritage crafts for sale to the tourists. His efforts for the promotion of tourism have been acknowledged internationally and nationally, and he has rec received a number of awards, including Commonwealth Asia Award for Excellence. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Aftab. Thank you very much, Maliha, for inviting me to participate in this uh, very important webinar. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Asad Khan and his team for organizing uh, this webinar to promote Pakistan's tourism potential and highlight the heritage of Pakistan. Uh, as the time is short, I have uh, otherwise uh, um, a, a lot of uh, things to show you about Pakistan potential, but in uh, nine to 10 minutes, I will try to give you a small glimpse of Pakistan and then see what the present government is doing to promote uh, tourism in Pakistan and facilitate uh, the whole uh, activity. Um, I can uh, share my screen now and start instantly my presentation. Uh, I hope you can see uh, it's there. Yeah, is it okay? My screen is visible to all? Yes. Okay, so uh, as the topic assigned to me, Pakistan uh, tourism potential and perspective from the government, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, look at Pakistan's tourist map, uh, you will find that it's a very, very interesting country in terms of tourism potential. And Pakistan is one of those countries in the world which are blessed with diverse inventory of uh, tourism attraction, uh, which is based on the unique endowment of natural landscape feature, biodiversity, and its rich cultural uh, heritage. And Pakistan, if you travel around, uh, you will see that the country has so much to offer to visitors. Uh, the people are amazed once they are here to explore uh, Pakistan as a tourist destination. Uh, if you look at the geographic uh, aspect of Pakistan, it is the place where you can find the three great mountain ranges meeting together, including Karakrum, Himalayas, and Hindu Kush. And we have some of the tallest mountain in the world, rather five peaks over 8,000 meter out of 14 in the world, and 102 peaks over 7,000 meter. 
and there are countless peaks between five to six thousand meter. And this is the place where you can also find world longest glaciers outside uh, polar region. And some of them are even longer than 74 kilometer. So this great landscape uh, provides us an opportunity to promote all different kinds of mountain adventure sports from mountaining, uh, rock climbing, uh, paragliding, river rafting, and skiing, and snowboarding, and whatnot. So it's a great, great landscape and a, uh, and a play field for adventure tourism. Uh, when we descend down from the high mountains, we pass through this kind of beautiful landscape of Karakrum, which is very easily accessible from the Karakrum Highway. While traveling on Karakum Highway, uh, you can see one of the most beautiful mountain landscape uh, in the world. Rather, this is the only highway, I must say, from where you can see at least one 8,000 meter peak uh, from the window of your car and more than six, seven peaks over 7,000 meter right from the road. So it's a great, great opportunity to travel from Islamabad towards China border and see the great landscape beauty all around on the way. Uh, further down in the valleys of Himalayas, we have this kind of lush green meadows where people can go for camping and trekking. And uh, there are lots of interesting communities which are living in these mountains. And also all these uh, valleys are dotted with hundreds of beautiful lakes and the many lakes which are still accessible only by foot. And one can explore the real wilderness uh, of these alpine wetlands in the mountains of Pakistan. Pakistan is a mountainous country all along, right from the uh, coastal belt of Makaran. You can see this kind of rocky terrain in the landscape of Hingol National Park, which is right on the Makaran coast. And Makaran coast itself is about 700 kilometer long highway, uh, which is on one side, the beautiful sandy beaches, and on the other side, this kind of rocky terrain. So exploring this uh, wilderness itself is a great adventure and charm in its own. Uh, in terms of historical perspective, although there are experts sitting in this forum, but I must say Pakistan has uh, something of the oldest uh, human history which you can witness in Pakistan, starting from Mehergar, uh, more than 7,000 years BC, and descending down to the Indus Valley civilization at Monjodaro, and then the Hindu dynasties, uh, various sites all around Pakistan, and also the great prayer of Gandhara, uh, all over spread from Peshawar to Madan to Chakdara, and all the way to the lower Sawat and towards Taxila. Uh, there are hundreds of these sites on which now government is focusing to develop them uh, for religious and religious heritage tourism for the Buddhist. And um, moreover, uh, there are beautiful cities like Peshawar, rather one of the oldest living cities we have in Pakistan, uh, like the Peshawar and the Lahore, for example, which has great Mughal heritage and also the British Raj period building and in the surrounding in the Punjab, the very, very interesting sites of Sufi Shains in the, especially in the Southern Punjab, in Multan, Sharif and Bahawalpur. So there's a lot of cultural diversity you can explore while traveling in Pakistan. And Punjab is also, ladies and gentlemen, the birthplace of uh, Sikh religion. Uh, you can see very nicely preserved Gurdwaras of uh, Sikh religion. And quite a lot of now Sikh Yatris have started coming to Pakistan uh, from America, Canada, and European market besides India. And descending down towards Sindh, you can explore the beautiful uh, land of Sufis and Shains, the many different shrines and old buildings and forts in the province of Sindh, which is very, very rich in terms of uh, cultural uh, heritage, which we have in Pakistan. And in between, there's also the deserts of Cholistan uh, and the Tharpark, uh, which has uh, some of the great heritage of Hakra Valley and also a living uh, heritage of uh, Cholistani people. And side by side, the uh, many interesting palaces of uh, Abbasi dynasties. So very interesting area in terms of uh, desert exploration, where the desert is not just uh, flat land, but dotted with a uh, lot of interesting features. And most importantly for me, uh, what I love in Pakistan is the living culture of Pakistan. When you're traveling in Pakistan, you never feel bored. You see, after every 60 to 70 kilometer, 
you find a different culture, different people, different faces, different food. So a great diversity of living culture you can explore while traveling from south to north or north to south. So this is one of the greatest aspect of Pakistan. And all these people, wherever you go, they're so humble and hospitable. Even when foreigners come, they even charge to them. They feel, I mean, they are in paradise, you see. And one of the oldest culture you can find in Pakistan is in the three intact valleys of Kailasha uh, in, the Cholas, in the area of Chitral, where there are 5,000 Kailasha people live. And now uh, this is the area where we are trying to preserve their culture and offer as a controlled tourism product with the help of Kailasha people. Uh, as the cultural diversity is rich and the landscape diversity is rich, same is the case with the wildlife of Pakistan. We have something about nine ecological zones starting from right the coastal belt to the world tallest mountain. So you can see in a one country the most beautiful alpine zone and in between and to the mangrove forest along the coastal line. So there's a great diversity of wildlife. People can come to enjoy the wildlife watching tours in Pakistan. And we have very recently started developing some products uh, for this. Moreover, the food and cuisine and the products available all over Pakistan are so uh, diverse and so rich in their taste. And they're all easily available on a very reasonable prices. It's amazing uh, in terms of the handicrafts as well. Wherever you go in Pakistan, in towns and cities, uh, you find people making in very, very beautiful products, handmade products, and they are, they are damn cheap. You see, people, are, people love to, uh, when they go back, take lots of souvenir for their family members and for their friends from Pakistan. Pakistan people are passionate about cake it, and this is the game of the nation. But side by side, we also play traditional games uh, like uh, wrestling, like uh, tent pegging, camel dancing, uh, bull race, and uh, polo, which is played in its most original form. And we have one of the highest polo field in Pakistan at the Shandu Top, where every year we organize a polo tournament. Thousands of people come and see this uh, there. Uh, Islamabad is a modern face of Pakistan. It's the capital city, well connected with the rest of the world. The good facilities of hotels available in Islamabad and many other places as well. And from here, you can move in all directions in Pakistan and explore the wonders of Pakistan, which we have. So Pakistan is not having just few tourism products. We have all different kinds of tourism, starting from the recreation tourism, adventure, culture, religious, sports, ecotourism, education, agri, shopping, business. So lots of different interests we can entertain in Pakistan based on this great potential we have. And gradually in Pakistan, now tourism is going up. In 2014, there was something about 1.5 million tourists traveling to see all these sites. And in 2018, the number has already gone to 6.6 .6 million. And keep in mind that presently there's a more domestic tourism, but gradually now foreign tourism is also improving. So far, we have just 4% of foreign tourism. That's why uh, Dr. Uh, Khan said, Pakistan is the best kept tourism secret in the world. The very few people know what Pakistan actually has in terms of tourism potential. But whosoever is coming to explore Pakistan, it must be, uh, you see, amazed to see the great diversity which we have in this country. So the present government is now doing quite a lot to promote tourism, especially uh, the present Prime Minister Imran Khan is very keen to develop tourism sector. And uh, as soon as he took over as the Prime Minister of this country, he decided to create a National Tourism Coordination Board and also started revamping of PTDC. He's the one who introduced the e-visa policy for 191 countries and also announced uh, the formulation of National Tourism Strategy. And the number of other aspects which we are now covering, and very soon, uh, in the last week of March, Pakistan is going to launch its first tourism brand to promote Pakistan abroad uh, as a de tourist destination. And hopefully that event will be uh, chaired by Prime Minister Imran Khan because he himself is the brand name for Pakistan. So uh, we are also going to launch a national tourism portal on this occasion, which will provide all the information about tourism places and services to tourists. And recently government has 
also announced the opening of Skardu Airport in the mountains as an international airport. So direct flights will start coming to there. And I, I hope that that will create a lot of uh, opportunities for adventure tourism in the mountain areas. PTDC is also now offering its motels and rest houses for the privatization to private investors. A lot of other schemes are under the process to develop new tourist zone in Pakistan. So lots of uh, new opportunities for the investments, especially for overseas Pakistanis and foreign investors who want to make the joint venture with Pakistani people are now available in tourism sector. And uh, whosoever is interested uh, can contact us uh, at my address given on the last slide. Uh, we can provide uh, more information on that. Ladies and gentlemen, CPAC is going to create a huge network of tourism uh, assets around the uh, new roads and highways, which are now in the almost final stage of completion in Pakistan, linking all the way China uh, via Kunjarab Pass to the Gawadar, uh, the main, uh, main road and the side road, uh, all are in the final process of completion. And all along this, there'll be new touristic zone, which will be in process. So quite a lot is going to happen in next three to five years uh, because of this improved infrastructure. So this is a brief uh, glimpse of Pakistan and the progress which we are making so far. If you need any further information, you can send us an email or chat with me on my WhatsApp number. I'll be more than happy to answer your queries. Or maybe you can chat on this uh, uh, webinars uh, chat and we can uh, try to answer your questions. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Aftab Rana Sahib. Uh, if we can have, okay, good. So uh, thank you. And uh, now we move on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Asma Ibrahim, who is a senior archeologist, museologist, and conservationist. She is the founder director of State Bank Museum, Archives and Art Gallery Department. Dr. Asma has to her credit the very human and modern considerations for making this museum the most accessible museum of Pakistan. Uh, she is a pioneer member, general secretary of an NGO, CSEAS Pakistan, and uh, she's also on uh, different boards. Um, she has done her postdoctoral fellowship as a Fulbright scholar in archeological chemistry, only scientist of Pakistan who's working on strontium, nitrogen, and oxygen isotopes in ancient human remains and glass to know the provenance of Indus Valley population and glass. Her research projects are aired separately, uh, repeatedly by BBC Horizon, Discovery Channel, ZDF in the form of documentaries, um, Mystery of the Persian Mummy and Indus Valley Civilization for BBC Channel 4. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Aspa. Uh, thank you, Maria, and I'm sorry for such a long <laughs> introduction of mine. It was not easy to read all that. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Asad Majid, Ms. Shaista Mahmood, and all others, the hosts of this uh, webinar, to invite me for this important and very uh, vital issue, which we are, uh, I think it's time that we should deal with this abroad. Dr. Asma, so, your video is off. Uh, yes, I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, That's why I, uh, uh, yeah. Because if the video is on, then the uh, presentation is not that good. So, okay. So as the title was, we will, I will be discussing very briefly the archaeological treasures of Pakistan, historic relics and multicultural heritage of Pakistan. And uh, to start with, I would like to bring this to the notice of uh, all the audience that we have an uninterrupted sequence of human occupation in the region of not only Karachi, but in Punjab, Chakwal, where we have discovered um, two million years old stone tool, which was the oldest in the world. But now in Ethiopia, we have one uh, 2.5 million year old stone tool. So this makes us the oldest civilization, or you can say the oldest archeological space in the world. Uh, here you can see some stone tools, which are in the museum. And uh, at the bottom, you can see uh, Rodi Hills, where we have more than 300 stone making tools, uh, workshops. This is all laid, you can see the white stuff. This is all um, stone tool factory. 
and I must tell everyone that they should visit this stone tool factory and the museum. Once we excavate all this stuff, it goes to the museum. So we have, uh, I think we have, uh, you can, one can say more than um, one of the best museums in the world. Uh, the best collections we have, like in the National Museum of Pakistan, we start from this two million year old stone tool and we come up to the contemporary. Then Peshawar Museum, Lahore Museum, we have world's best collections. Uh, here you can see again the Rory Hill and the workshop, the stone tools are here, then we have megaliths. So I'm bringing you from the stone tool up to the present times, how the history is traveling and we have uninterrupted history in Pakistan. I believe that when you connect with history where it took place, something special happens, that's my belief. And in order to understand ourselves, we have to understand how we got here. One can read history in books, but being on the spot help us to put the past in context, and which is very, very important that we should visit these sites. So the reason to bring all these, to show you these figurines is that we have more than 3,000 such figurines, which have more than 500 hairstyles, and which is one of my favorite that uh, I would like to work on the hairstyles. Then you can see the flora and fauna of the site. This is the site of Mehrgar. And all these things are located in the National Museum and the other museums of Pakistan. So if you would like to visit, you're most welcome. Look at the beautiful figurines we have. Coming back to uh, the site of Kotiji, which is pre-Indus. So it's, it's a, like I said, it's uninterrupted history. So we come from Stone Age to Mehrgar, which is 7,000 BC. Then you come to pre-Indus sites. This is site of Kotiji. And at the back, you can see the fortress of the Kotiji, which is Talpur period. But this Kotiji site is 3,500 BC. And here, this spot, which is located in the National Museum of Pakistan, is the first sign of evolution of the religion. This is the snake deity, which you can see. And it is such a lightweight pot that it's like air. You can't even feel that there is a weight in this pot. And you won't believe this was made in 3,500 BC at the site of Kotiji. Then you come to Aladino, which is uh, near Karachi in Mali. This is 3,500 again, and it is linked to the sites of uh, Mesopotamia. You can see the beautiful uh, jewelry made at this site in 3,500 BC, and which is pre-Indus, before Mohenjo-Daro. And then we have beautiful rock carvings in Kirthar, in, in uh, Chilas, in northern areas. One, one needs to visit all these uh, uh, rock carvings, which are very beautiful and important part of our history. Then again, like Aftab Sab already showed you um, the uh, Manjudaro site. It starts from 2500 BC and we come up to the Kushan period and we have a coin collection discovered from the top of the stupa. And um, in the King Priest, which is the only one which is and here, the king piece is why it is important because this is the only statue discovered from Indus Valley with, and it shows the textile invention. And you can see the trefoil pattern, which is here and the headband and the armband. So it shows that he was some uh, person of, uh, you can see um, of value or the head of the uh, state, one can say. And as we think that the Mohenjo-daro was the head of the uh, headquarter of the Indus civilization. So this must be very, very important person. But we are not known about this because we haven't deciphered the language yet. Not the language exactly, but it's a script which we need to decipher. Still, we are working on it. And the beautiful jewelry we have discovered from Mohenjo-daro. This is in Mohenjo-daro Museum as well as in the National Museum of Pakistan. So coming to the historic and prehistoric forts in Balochistan, here we have Haran, which has a, a Zoroastrian influence. Then we have prehistoric fortresses and then historic fortress in uh, Balochistan. All this is located in Balochistan. And every kilometer in Balochistan, we have a Harappan site. So this is a must to visit Balochistan and see the beautiful and unique architecture. Here you can see the influence of uh, um, Khurasan, Iran, on the tombs of uh, um, not only this, the down where I'm standing is the Balochistan tomb, and here's the Wazi Khan tomb, which is in Dadu. So you can see, I mean, although the communication and the travel was not that easy, but all these influences we do find in our uh, country and which we need to visit. Here, uh, we, uh, 
we have already seen the temple of Katas, which is again one of the unique things or unique site of uh, Punjab in Chakwal. And the other unique thing in Chakwal is that we have uh, uh, fossilized uh, skeletons uh, of mammoth, elephant, deer in the beautiful rocks of Chakwal. So this whole area should be designated as heritage and one need to visit that. Uh, all over they are scattered and they are huge in size, but few of them we kept in the museum, but the huge ones are still in the rocks and one can visit those. This is again one of the abandoned old city of Tulaja in Son Valley, Chakwal. And coming to Kushab, we have beautiful huge temples in Kushab, which are again unique and need to be researched on, but Firstly, you all have to visit these beautiful temples. Then on the right side is the Nandana Fort in Chakwal, which was built by Hindus and uh, it was later conquered by Mahmud of Basna. And this location is famous because here, Al-Biruni calculated the circumference of the earth. He was living in a room on the top of the mountain where he calculated the circumference of the earth. Coming back to KPK, we have the by, uh, Gandhara period, the Pai Monastery and other monasteries. We have two influences in Gandhara. One is Indian and the other one is Greek. So that is another interesting thing to see in our museums that how we have two types of uh, statues of Gandhara in stucco and chist stone. And then uh, the Julia, which is again one of the monasteries, which is at the top of a mountain, a beautiful uh, monastery. And then Kafir Port, which is in KPK. You can see the temples beautifully constructed with bricks and uh, Bam Bamla stupa, which is another unique stupa recently discovered and excavated. Here we have Gaur Khatri, which is a Buddhist monastery and later a sacred Hindu temple. So what is interesting is that, that one can see the sequences, how they originated and how later they were converted into Hindu monuments or uh, Buddhist monuments. That's another thing to visit. And then smaller votive stofas in uh, KPK, Mansera rock addicts, which were uh, done by uh, Ashoka, and he is giving a good faith messages on these rocks. 14 rock addicts of Ashoka are in Shebazgari, and the, the top one is at Mansera. Then uh, we have stone circles as well, like we have in Great Britain. So this is in Asuta uh, Sawabi Tasil. Then uh, come, uh, coming down to Sindh, we have beautiful temples, Jain temples and Hindu temples in Buddhisar and Nagar Parker. This, is, this whole area is covered with different uh, temples and uh, mandir, temples and mandirs and um, uh, other monuments of that time period. Now the Islamic period. So Islam came to this region through um, Bambor, area of Bambor, which we call the doorway to Islam where Muhammad bin Qasim landed. And we have the first mosque of South Asia here. You can see the remains of the mosque. And again, this site has a beautiful museum and it has a continuous uh, uh, chronology from first century BC up to the Muslim period. Here you can see the Hindu influence, the Buddhist influence, and then the mosque on top of it. And the Kufic, first ever Kufic written on the pottery, which is in the museum, available for all you, all of you to visit. And beautiful architecture in Tatta. Mughals uh, did not ignore uh, Tatta at all. And they have gifted us with this beautiful mosque. It has 99 domes and the, you don't need a speaker for prayer and for azan, and it is eco all over. This is unique in that sense. And then the greatest necropolis of Makli, uh, which starts from 17th century up to the 20th century. Again, we come to the same. This is Fort of Fort Dichi, which is uh, made by Talpus. And Ranikur Fort, which is also called Wall of China. It has 20 kilometers, uh, 20 mile uh, circumference, which is one of the huge fortresses of South Asia. Then we have uh, these, uh, particular type of chokhandis. So initially we had chokhandis. Some of the chokhandis are with the domes and some of them are without dome. So these are, we have documented like more than 200 chokhandi graveyards all over Sindh and Balochistan. And every, they are scattered everywhere and show the evolution from Balochistan to uh, Sindh, how these people were traveling to Sindh and taking this tradition with them. Here we have Jiwani, uh, graveyard, which is, you can see, influenced by the uh, tomb of Cyrus the Great, and then Pirlako in Sin. This is another graveyard. 
and then Sogdian ossuary, which is uh, the Muslim graves were actually influenced by these uh, ossuaries. And uh, one can see these, one is in Balakot, Pasni, and we have several such graveyards all over Balochistan. And say. But, well, I will be very short because the time is short, but uh, this I would not uh, want to just <laughs> give up because this is the south and southwest of Indus Delta where we have series of beautiful um, fortresses, which uh, in this area I've worked for more than 15 years and we have discovered a lot of fortresses in this area in the Delta. So one need to visit this through boat or by foot, but not all the fortresses can be done by foot. This is Rato Fort where I, where I excavated and then I have discovered an underwater city which is visible only in few days and the later days of the dates of the moon and for two hours in the morning where we have discovered a huge Jamia mosque and a small mosque and a kiln where the pottery was made. Here you can see this uh, stone uh, because of which I could discover the city. This is the only example of plated Kufik in South Asia and uh, here we have a beautiful mosque which is also under the water now. You can see the beautiful work in Juna Shabandar, the fortress. So these fortresses are a must to visit. And uh, because of these mint marks, I have discovered the fortress of uh, Alexander the Great, and uh, which he built and he divided his armies through uh, land and through sea. So this is Gujo and you have to visit. And here we come to the Daragar Fort in Chakwal, which already after have discussed. Uh, so to end my uh, presentation, I would say that archaeological tourism will not only help generate revenue, but it will also bring job opportunities for local people working as tourist guides. Thus, it will also end in creating awareness about the site and which we feel when we go into the far off areas for digging. So we feel that these people need occupation, jobs. So this only the archaeological tourism can help these people. So please do visit these areas and any information you require about them. We have published these and I'm here to uh, assist you all. Thank you so much for giving me time for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asma. It was a very, it was truly a learning experience. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move on to our next panelist, uh, Zain Mustafa. Uh, Zain Mustafa is an architect and educationist based in Karachi, Pakistan. He is the founder of Cube Edu Tours, a unique heritage architecture education tourism initiative, taking learning about bioregional shared history to heritage, heritage sites across Pakistan. His focus is exploring and discovering Pakistan's rich and diverse history through his heritage architecture educational tour experiences, expanding on his professional practice portfolio by designing prestige projects like NIC Karachi. Uh, and he is also, to his credit, uh, designing several restaurants like Tao and the unique revamp of a new animal centric, sensitive Karachi Zoo. Having lived, worked, and been educated at Parsons School of Design and Columbia University, US, throughout his life as a global citizen, Mr. Mustafa's experiences and worldviews are not only unique, but also value addition to any global discussions, discourses, and issues which need multiple scales of design perspective. Uh, over to you, Zen. Uh, extravagant introduction, um, very humbling. Uh, you have a script. Hai. If you can follow it as I speak, you'll know that which slide we have to shift. Folks, I'm sorry, I'm not able to control my slides from here. Malia mm -hmm. is going to help me with that. Right? So, and I will just start. Uh, as soon as you load my presentation. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, our ambassador and his team, for allowing me this opportunity to take you on a brief journey through Pakistan with me. This exploratory journey started many years ago as a child studying in the UK and as a young adult in the US, answering others' questions about where I was from. But it really kicked in 10 years ago when I started delving deeper into who I was, where I came from, and what were my cultural genetics, my roots, my identity. Next slide, please. Understanding the place where we are from ancient times through the movement of empires 
people and trade routes has been key in my learnings. These maps have also made me realize that present day Pakistan's geographical location at the center of the east-west Silk Route with north-south access to the Arabian Sea and Africa, thanks to the mighty river Indus, Sindhu, giving birth to the word India has made my identity not only vast, diverse and rich, but also inclusive. Next slide. The 7,000 year old Indus Valley civilization, often referred to as the cradle of civilization, sibling to Samaria and Egypt, thanks to the Euphrates, Tigris and Nile, is therefore also a shared set of genetics not just Pakistani. This is the very inclusivity I refer to. From one of the largest and oldest planned cities of Moenjadaro, an invaluable site relevant to all of us, with a good chance that some of us today can trace their forefathers back to having been on a trade route through this very city once upon a time. Next, please. Take a moment to imagine what bustling life there must have been up and down the 100 plus cities of the Indus. And then, as that drew to its end, deeply spiritual educational environments like Takh Bahi, our gem of a tantric Buddhist monastic university complex in Martan, laid the foundation for a burgeoning Buddhist community coming in to settle in the northern areas at the foothills of the tallest peaks in the world. Next, please. Our mountains, the mountains we share with our ancestors as well, have many beautiful, often hidden, lost secrets. For example, the Greeks amongst us today believe that Alexander the Great on his Eastern conquests, coming as far as the river Indus had spent time in the area we call the Kalash Valley. Malia, I think you need to go back one slide. Thank you. And that these people are his genes. How wonderful is that? The earth bound pagan spiritual history of the Kalash stretches right across our northern areas from the Bakan border to Kashmir. Today's small community is a living museum of what was a lifestyle ages ago, a culture and community to treasure and celebrate together globally. Next slide. Their ancient architecture with the signature oculus in the ceilings of their buildings Usually places of prayer can be seen in more modern two buildings too, layered with Tibetan influences like the Baltit and Altit forts from a mere thousand years ago in Hunza, with a style of earthquake-proof cribbage unique to mountain architecture, a mesmerizing timeless sensitivity to the land, the rivers, the people, and the silk trade route we can all be inspired by. The sounds of the earth as built form. Next, please. From one language of fort architecture to another, we have more to share. The world's largest fort, Ranikot Fort, only a four hour drive from Karachi, sits nestled beautifully camouflaged in the foothills of the Kirtar mountain range, the tail end of the mighty Karakoram, potentially a precursor to the Great Wall of China, 2,500 years old, and connected to the offshoot of the massive Russian Scythian Empire, the Indo Scythians and the Sakas. The Scythians, mentioned by Homer in the Odyssey, makes this majestic three four complex not only another reason for a cultural connection to the Greeks, but also the Russians. Imagine that, more lost shared history to bring us together. Next slide. From one fortification to another, the Sufi traditions of Pakistan, as we all know, cross all borders from east to west and hundreds of years. The vibrant shrine of Bibi Jivandi, a female saint famed for her jurisprudence, is a site where one feels the vibrant energy of her soul, alive. Even though it has been damaged enormously by a flood, it is still one of a long series of the magical spaces across Pakistan for the soulful amongst us. If you have seen the whirling dervishes of Turkey and Egypt, or the raw trance-inducing tamals of India, this is one of those spaces we can all feel our inner voices sing. Next, please, Maria. From a journey following our inner voices to the deep inner desert sounds of Rajasthan, in the far southeast corner of Pakistan lie the gentle earth-built homes of Thar and Nagarpakar, villages scattered among the rolling dunes with peacocks flying from thatched roof to thatched roof, the seat of famous Mughal Emperor Akbar, whose family lineage brought him from Central Asia, today's Uzbekistan. Here in Umarkot was the pivotal moment in Mughal history which took their empire 
past the north-south Indus River, beyond Lahore and Delhi, across the then Bharat to its east and south to become the rich, wealthy, stacked in art, history, culture, architecture, music, food, pre-East East India Company empire, when the modern language of Urdu was also born. Next, please. What happened after them? Where were they buried? There is much we can see from the way they buried their dead at Makli, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, from the Sama to the Mughals, clearly relevant to not just me, but all of us here, you and your ancestors too, stretched across a four kilometer length with 80 mausoleums, 400 years of architectural history, and over 150,000 graves. It's not just a cemetery, it's a magical encyclopedia waiting to be studied with design influences, stone carvings, and tile work from neighboring Gujarat to Konya. Next, please. Talking of high-end sophistication and style and design, architecture and the sacred geometry of form, reflected in the beautiful carved tile work, the perfect mathematics and proportions, the Mughals, especially that the great Emperor Shah Jahan was known for. Other than the Taj Mahal, the Agra and Lahore fort, there is his last and stunning mosque right next to Makli in Tatta, a few hours from Karachi. Does it hark back to what you have seen in Samarkand, Bukhara and Iran? Yes, it should. Same lineage. Not a series of isolated moments in time, but design movements carried across the borders over hundreds of years. Next, please. Weaving into the colonial East India Company era as a, is a flamboyant genre of aristocracy, the Mirs and Nawabs. The Talpur Mirs of Sindh have left their legacy in ornate mausoleums, built with an expression of love for their heritage, to balance the incoming Western thought beautifully crafted and colorful with jewel-like kashikari tile details to be enjoyed as one experiences each of their buildings. Next, please, Malia. Right next to them, moving from central Sindh up to southern Punjab and the romance of the Cholistan Desert, Bahawalpur and its myriad of forts strewn across the desert, lies the massive three-story tall Dravar fort of the Nawab Abbasi family first built in the ninth century by a Hindu Rajput ruler. It was upgraded in the 18th century by the Abbasi family and the last of the Nawabs, the most famous of them, of, of most famous of them all was born in it in 1904. Next please. The Abbasi Nawabs of Bahawalpur, educated, extremely well-traveled and with a flair for the finer things in life, built these magnificent palaces with the help of Italian architects, creating a new Indo-Italian hybrid style of palazzo architecture, unique to them. It is said that Sadiqar Palace generated power for all of Bahawalpur, and Nawab Sadiq was a key donor to Pakistan's exchequer when the country was founded in 1947, a true patriot. Another facet of a rich design history for us to celebrate, bringing our Italian family to us. Next, please. Of course, our rich colonial history, which gave us several unique designs and architecture taken from local materials, craftsmen, and climatic needs can be found in Karachi. Some iconic buildings like the pink Indo-Mughal proportions and silhouettes of the elegant Karachi municipality building, the neo-Gothic form of Frere Hall, the Rajasthani-inspired style of Mohatta Palace Museum, once the home of Pakistan's founder, Jinnah's sister, and his own, yellow gizri stone more typical of the colonial form, Flagstaff House Museum. Just a few of many buildings over 150 years right here in Karachi. Each of our major cities, Hyderabad, Quetta, Lahore, Peshawar, have their own set of beautiful colonial buildings. Next, please. With this array of architectural language over 4,000 plus years, there is an equally rich history of music and musical instruments with as many influences and as many intonations to enjoy and get lost in. From the mountains to the Arabian Sea, along both sides of the Indus River, tucked away in shrines or in village ceremonies, some Sufi, some folk, some nomadic, other more settled, each an architecture unto itself and reflective of that region's customs, beliefs, and traditions. Next, please. 
this broad range of music history. Next slide, please. This broad range of music history dovetails with the dances we are, can be equally proud of. You know, one back. Well, yeah, one back, yeah. This broad range of music history dovetails with the dances we can be equally proud of, often tribal and rural, the color and the costumery, the footwork, the body movement, the celebration of who they are, where they live, the land, the terrain, and life's simple joys in general. On our architectural heritage editors, we always welcome and include local storytellers, musicians, and folk dancers wherever possible for a holistic absorption of Pakistan's deep cultural heritage. Next, please. Thank you. Last but not least, let's talk briefly about the traditional handicrafts we create all over Pakistan. Pottery, textiles, metalwork, jewelry, hats, shoes, decorative details, and so much more. So much for us to show the world the knowledge our forefathers have passed down through the generations, not written through family traditions, designs that we could all take a moment to look at and find some connection in other global design traditions, wherever you come from. It's time we came together to celebrate our shared heritage through the lens of Pakistan's cultural history. Last, please. I look forward to seeing you all in Pakistan soon on an editor with me or a long-term fellowship supported by your governments, educational institutes, historians, filmmakers, bloggers, and tour operators. Thank you once again. Thank you, Zain. Thank you. Um, and now, thank you. Uh, and now uh, I would request uh, Jean Gardner, uh, Professor Emerita, uh, who's an activist, writer, teacher, public speaker, and visionary on design for a living earth. Um, she has been teaching social ec ecological history and design at the School for Constructed Environments, Parsons Schools for Design, New York. She has served on many design juries, including the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, where she is an expert advisor. Uh, Gardner also wrote the first book on urban wilderness, nature in New York City. She is co-author with Brian McGarth of Cinematrics Architecture Drawing Today. Her current research focuses on design practice and uh, pedagogy and their relationship to the creation of present ecological problems such as climate change. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Jean. Thank you. I'm going to set up the shared screen and show you the untold mysteries of Pakistan. But before doing that, I want to thank Ambassador Khan and his team for inviting me here today. I'm an outsider. I haven't been to Pakistan yet. And I'm looking forward to going there. I've been to many countries in the North American continent, the South American, Europe, Turkey, but I haven't been to Pakistan. And I want to share with you why I think you should go there if you haven't been or go to particular sites. Because I think being there, as we've been hearing from other presentations, is the only way to understand it's globally relevant heritage. And I'm finding out I have a very extensive personal history with it. So let's look in detail at the places that I think you might go and why. How about going here first? The most ancient city on the earth, not discovered until the 1920s. It's vitally important to all countries concerned with the current climate change crisis. This city's mysteries hold climate change solutions for institutions, government agencies, humanitarian groups, and urban planning offices that are working on climate change. I suggest to you that you develop for and with these organizations structures and funding for trips to this site by offering internships, grants, research scholarships, the combination of Pakistan 
of a, in Pakistan of a 4,500 year old urban settlement with historic information about effects of climate change is absolutely unique. And here, as you can see, I'm building on Zen Mustafa's presentation. I suggest also going to Kalash without question to talk to the people, especially if your country still has large indigenous populations like Greenland, Bolivia, Guatemala, Nepal, Algeria, Morocco, or Kenya. Your anthropologists and bioregionalists can learn from these native peoples who have lived here for centuries, learn how their clothes, rituals, festivals, games, even language still are their identity. How to do it, create fellowships and summer programs for indigenous groups and others to go there from your country. For instance, and also send members of your fashion industry supply chain. Who are they? Fashion designers, fabric suppliers, dye processors, manufacturers of the finished items. These are just a few of the people to send. And one of my absolute favorites, I haven't been there, but Runny Coat. Maybe this could be your first choice. All countries have defensive structures and technologies. Turkey, Spain, India, France, Syria have epic castles and forts. Runny Coat, however, stands out from the rest because it's the world's largest fort with a circumference of 20 miles and it is camouflaged. Ancient warfare differs, of course, from modern, but no matter what country you come from, warfare involves individuals making decisions and formulating policies. Individuals from human rights organizations, members of the military, veterans, and anti-war groups like the Quakers. Runny Coat is a place for those with differing points of view to meet in a value new environment, to listen to each other with no outside distractions, perhaps to initiate bipartisan plans to take home. Well, this is also Tar, one of my favorites, so you'll have to choose for yourself. But too many countries today have deserts like this one. Pakistan's is unique. It's because it is the most densely populated desert in the world. Its roads, infrastructure, and human settlements date back to civilizations thriving 55,000 years ago when it was not a desert, but a tropical forest with a vast river network. Firms involved in sustainability initiatives, regenerative design, experts, NGOs focusing on climate resilience, engineers, concerned with water shortages, plant experts studying vegetation that might mitigate climate change impacts, this is the place for them to go. Also, geologists and earth scientists in partnership with anthropologists should come here to study its bioregion with its relationships between the desertification of the region and the evolution of human culture. Raise funds from public and private grant giving organizations, foundations, civic mind entrepreneurs, all interested in new ways of surviving. And then there's Mockley. No matter where you are from, <coughs> a major city there has notable graveyards, Tokyo, Rio, Paris, London, Cairo, Lisbon, but none like this one one of the largest funerary sites in the world, 10 kilometers built over 400 years with 500 to a million tombs having multiple religious influences. A fitting place for your university PhD students in religion and religious leaders to discuss changing burial rites. Develop fellowships and internships for your studies and scholars who are interested in them to come here and talk with Pakistani experts. While in Pakistan, they should meet with also with Pakistani land conservationists, religious scholars, 
to discuss how COVID-19 and climate change are affecting land use religious practices, explore with them developing green burial practices that are ethical, religiously suitable, and environmentally sustainable. And this leaves me mosque. <laughs> this mosque leaves me really speechless, as I just demonstrated. The um, university PhD students uh, in your areas of religion should also visit this, not just the graveyard, the funerary yard. It contains the most elaborate display of tile work in the Indian Pakistani subcontinent. Its dome never fails to mesmerize. When you look up into it, even here on a photo, you feel as if you're looking out into the universe itself. How is that possible? Send your architects and interior designers to learn from Pakistani experts how the geometry of your body is the same as the domes. Study the effects the dome has on your neurological system. Send your craftspeople to study the blue tile making process to understand how the tile forms and professional proportions fit into these same geometric patterns. Prayer Hall in Karachi. Pakistan has outstanding examples of British colonial architecture, but so do other countries. If you're from North America, British West Indies, Australia, New Zealand, or South Africa, you also have colonial icons. Send your architects, interior designers, adaptive reuse experts, send them there to study its preserved architecture and renovated rooms with Pakistanis whose field this is. They will teach you how to adapt your own colonial icons to current needs. Just a minute here, somehow this has come down. Okay, whoops. Musical instruments. This slide shows outstanding Pakistani handmade and hand played instruments because they are essential to why we should still engage the hand in educating future designers. This was my topic in a presentation at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts with Frank Wilson, a leading neurologist. Our focus was the intimate connection between the human hand and the development of creative thinking and lang language capacities. Handcrafts are not a frill, but essential to the full development of our creative, intellectual, emotional, and social capacities. It's vital that your teachers of the arts and music, professors at institutes specializing in this area, and leading craftsmen go to Pakistan, a world leader in making musical instruments. They will also learn about science, engineering, and math when they are shown how the musical instruments are made and how they are created. Folk dancing. Frank Wilson, the neurologist, and I also spoke about the sounds hand-played musical instruments make and the direct effects they have on your neurological systems. This slide shows the effects of the sounds musicians evoke from their handmade Pakistani instruments. The movements of the dancers in response to the sounds combine memory, order, and sequencing skills. Teaching dance in academic settings develops skills necessary for community, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. Create the programs, find the funds, and send all involved with the study and making and playing of musical instruments to Pakistan, a world leader in this field. And finally, my work with Frank Wilson is also relevant to a growing concern. He warns about the serious threat to our thinking and emotional capacities when computers are used extensively in education. In our smartphone world of instant technological results, many find themselves longing for older skills and the more reflective pastimes of our heritage. We yearn to work with our hands, 
long enough to get lost in a creative moment, nor do we want to work alone. So please plan your trip to Pakistan now to experience directly what I have just shown you and what the others have as well. And I want to thank you. Pakistan is an ancient living culture that is globally relevant to gay today. Engage with it and together let's build a better world in response to today's challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gardner. Um, now uh, we move on to the question and answers. Um, Asma, uh, Dr. Asma, um, there's a participant who has asked us that why this Pakistan history is not taught to children in the school. Why don't we own it and know about our heritage from an early age? This was a question uh, put for you and I, uh, you can answer the part which relates to you. Uh, yes, this is a big question and I always ask this question to myself also and I have tried to answer this question while I was establishing the Museum of State Bank and we have started from pre-Islamic coinage up to the Islamic coinage and this history is why it is not taught but uh, I cannot answer this at this forum because I don't feel that um, it's appropriate to answer here. I have been into many committees and I have tried to include this into the curriculum, but somehow we are not able to do that. So whatever we can do at our end, I did it and I did in this in my museum. And people are really amazed to see that there were people before uh, Muslims also, and there was a Stone Age and how we have evolved from Stone Age man up to the present civilized and technological man. So, uh, well, through museums, we can do that. And these are the indirect instit educational institutions, I believe, that we must visit museums and we must take schools to the museum. That is why we have very educational uh, visits of the museum, uh, of schools in our museum. And I try to teach them as much as I can. So this is what I can do at my end, but I cannot help in the curriculum, <laughs> sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, for Aftabu Remansa, uh, are there authorized travel guides by the government? Uh, and can we contact, can we have a contact to arrange our tours to Pakistan? Also, uh, a number of participants uh, were keen on knowing the security situation and the condition of tourism infrastructure in Pakistan. Uh, yes, I have tried to answer a couple of questions uh, in the question answer say, a box and uh, we have a, a system of registered tour operator and tour guides and i have uh, uh, shared the a number on which if you could send me your contact uh, we will link you up with the most appropriate tour guide or tour operator uh, because some are experienced in adventure some in culture some in uh, recreation sightseeing so yes we have a system and uh, if you book your tour uh, through the registered operators, you'll be in the safe hands and they will ensure all the arrangements are done uh, properly and safety security is properly managed. Infrastructure has improved quite a lot in the recent years and the number of good hotel chains now in Pakistan and number of new hotel chains are also coming up and uh, hopefully uh, once people are coming to Pakistan, they will have a very, very hospitable environment. People are very friendly. And in the recent years, the security conditions as a whole has improved quite a lot in Pakistan. And I have, uh, I have seen, and maybe you must have seen uh, as well, uh, the vlogs by a number of international travels. They are always very, very you know, positive about the, uh, the traveling in Pakistan and their feelings about the people of Pakistan is always ex extraordinary. Uh, you know, they, they are all uh, having good time whenever they are in Pakistan. So that's no issue. I think it's just the uh, uh, perception which has been created by the media. Pakistan is a very, very safe and friendly country. Uh, once you are here, you can experience it yourself. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gardner, um, a participant uh, has asked, what is one place you look forward to visiting in Pakistan? 
And then there's another question for you. What are the buildings made of that have the intricate details that they are able to withstand time and weather? Well, uh, do I have to hit my screen or what? How does this work? Can you see me? The I can see you and hear you. Good. That's a very, very, very important question. And it's a very serious concern right now. The materials of heritage sites are always local. This is a fundamental premise of working sustainably in having local materials because they're acclimatized to the place. But climate change is changing the conditions of every place on the world. So many of these heritage sites, I don't wanna be extravagant, but I would say all of them are being destroyed by the changes in climate. That's why the designation of a heritage site needs to come with funding to help understand this is a real challenge to architects, how we can preserve sites. Some of them weren't even visible in the Indus Valley until recently. So they were protected by being buried, but now they're visible to the toxic air, the changes in temperature. So your question is extremely important because we're not talking about anything that has answers. And that's really key. And that's why I, all, all these incredible presentations, if we could all bring our knowledge together with everyone who's listening, we might do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Zain Mustafa, a, a number of participants after appreciating your uh, presentation wanted you to know how they can sign up for your educational tours. If you can drop in a link in the chat or, um, you know, tell a bit about how can they, you know, contact you. Thank you, Maliha. As you know, I'm on my phone because uh, my Wi-Fi was not supporting me, but um, it's very easy. The Cube Editors can be found on Instagram and on Facebook. Everybody's on social media. Um, the links were on the, on the presentation, but I could always send them to you and you can forward them. Uh, we are very easy to find on Google and then they can track me down, send us a DM. Our tours happen all year round and they're season based. So depending on where it's cold and where it's warm and where it's hot, we travel around the country for whoever wanted to know. There's 50 destinations at this point. Uh, 50 of the major destinations. Of course, there's hundreds that one can go to. We're actually only hitting 50 so far. And just uh, find us on Facebook or Instagram, send a DM and join the next upcoming tour. We're going to be in Darkana day after tomorrow. Moin Jadaro. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have another question. I think Asma, you can answer this. How do you make museums more engaging and interactive for the local population? Yes, for, uh, that is a very good question because mostly our museums' captions are in English. So what we have tried is that we have uh, audios in every gallery which are giving explanation about the museum and the panels. And secondly, we have certain uh, technological things like we have uh, chaos where we have the whole um, collection preserved with the full information. Then recently we have been adding augmenting reality and uh, other internet um, games or uh, one can say um, in the kiosk we have several things which are very much engaging for uh, visitors plus we have uh, other cardboard games manual games for younger generation because I believe that they should not be out of touch with their own um, heritage so we have several kind of things we have timelines uh, so and different exhibitions we keep changing exhibitions so that people keep coming once they visit the museum that's not the end of it so they keep coming and we keep changing the exhibitions we have um, summer camps uh, we have different speech uh, contests and uh, um, exhibitions and plus uh, different programs of speeches and uh, from with the help of the schools. And our very interesting program is with the special schools. They come over and they do different tableaus and whatever their schools are teaching them. So we are taking care of everyone in the museum and you have to visit and see yourself also. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, a lot of participants were interested in the video footage of this uh, webinar. Uh, we will have it uh, placed on our website, on our Facebook page, and on our YouTube channel. Uh, and with this, uh, I would request His Excellency Dr. Asad Majid Khan for his concluding remarks. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, I must say, very, very informative uh, and educative uh, presentations. And it seems that uh, uh, even our potential uh, is a secret from us. Uh, there are so many things, uh, frankly, that I have learned. And each time, actually, uh, we do this. Uh, uh, we did one on uh, Lahore, uh, a virtual tour of Lahore. And earlier, we did one on uh, the Sikh. Uh, heritage in Pakistan, and each time, uh, uh, you know, the presentations uh, uh, opened up, uh, uh, you know, avenues, uh, frankly, uh, that, uh, and I consider myself uh, who's been interested in tourism all my life and have uh, kind of uh, expensively traveled. Uh, but clearly, I think uh, we need to do a better job of even uh not uh, keeping it as a secret from us pakistanis also and 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 there is actually a tremendous uh, uh, appetite uh, scope uh, for uh, promoting domestic tourism and i think professor gardner made a very important and interesting point and and that's about the very title of this uh, webinar today and she said that you in pakistan have a globally relevant heritage and, and, and that really is true because, you know, walking through the uh, streets of Pakistan, walking through different areas of Pakistan, you are actually doing a journey, undertaking a journey through human history uh, and learning about human civilization. So that's not just our heritage, that is the common heritage uh, of everyone around the world. And, and that uh, makes it even more uh, important and I would say compelling uh, for people to to consider uh, coming to Pakistan. And on that score, uh, I, I, I'd like to make three important points uh, because we are conscious and mindful of uh, uh, us doing a better job. Uh, and I think the presentations today, and we are certainly going to upload these presentations uh, because they present uh, Pakistan in ways that frankly I have not seen uh, in, in many, many years. And, and this is what, and, and with virtual being more accepted today than in the past, I think this would uh, certainly educate people. But uh, three things, one, security. Uh, the, the perception uh, and the realities on the ground. Uh, and I can tell you, and I'm not saying this because I'm Pakistan's ambassador here in Washington, but I'm saying this, uh, as a citizen of Pakistan, statistically, empirically, uh, today the Pakistani security uh, is remarkably improved uh, than what it was. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, since the media only focuses on the negative, uh, and therefore the perceptions still lingers on, uh, while the reality is on the ground. Islamabad today, statistically, and areas to the north of uh, uh, Islamabad right up to our border with China are some of the safest areas uh, in the world. And even if you travel into uh, rural Pakistan, uh, so that part is, uh, I think, uh, much improved. Uh, and we take uh, 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 that seriously. Uh, and uh, based on that confidence, we have uh, fundamentally revised our visa policy. Today, uh, uh, nationals of 50 countries can actually get visa on arrival. Uh, we have digitized uh, our uh, entire visa system. You know, 175 countries uh, can actually apply for Pakistani visa from the comfort of their home. Uh, and all of this process is streamlined uh, so that uh, we welcome uh, foreign uh, tourists uh, to visit Pakistan and to uh, discover Pakistan. Uh, and the third uh, point is, is the so-called infrastructure deficit uh, that we face uh, uh, in the tourism sector. And, and on that, uh, uh, the, the managing director of uh, Mr. Haftab has uh, uh, actually spoken about uh, uh, how the government uh, is coming up with very generous incentives. And, and this is happening not because 
uh, we just want to attract foreign tourism because there is tremendous domestic appetite also. And I, and I say this because as, as someone who, has, who was brought up in Lahore and would take all the guests coming out from different parts uh, to visit some of these sites and uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, you would not uh, see too many people visiting these sites. But now, over the weekend, if you go to Lahore Fort, it is even hard to walk around that fort. It is so crowded. So that appetite, and uh, I think the question of uh, why we are not educating our youth, I think we must, because this is our pride. Uh, we are home to some of the oldest civilizations, civilizations that introduced organized urban living, civilizations that introduced organized agriculture, civilizations that have introduced so much to the world. And then we must be proud of that. And then we must introduce that. And I think visiting museums uh, is, is an important, and I see this here, you know, in Washington, D.C., all museums are free entry museums. Uh, and uh, I think more than 50% uh, of those who visit uh, those museums are the students from various schools, not just around the DMV area, but from across the United States. And in each city, uh, museums are uh, basically a way uh, to basically portray our past uh, with the objective of learning from it. So I thank all the panelists for uh, today uh, for making these very compelling and very impressive presentations. Uh, the objective today was to highlight heritage. So it may have come across a uh, uh, little uh, overlap and duplication, but each one of you actually covered it uh, from your very specific perch uh, and perspective. And we do look forward to uh, continuing this effort in future also uh, in, in, in a determined way uh, to bring Pakistan, our culture, our cuisine, our music, and we will bother experts from Pakistan and around the world who have studied Pakistan more closely uh, to and discover uh, to discover Pakistan for you. So thank you very much, uh, particularly to International uh, Friendship Club, to Shaista and all the members of the club for being our partner in this. And I do hope, as, as Professor Gardner said, uh, that uh, uh, this is going to put Pakistan on your travel itinerary, if not in next three months, perhaps next year, but do consider and test us on our warmth and hospitality in Pakistan. Thank you very much.